Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Today I want to talk about one of the most maligned organizations within the entire galaxy, the Trade Federation of Planets. This mega conglomerate is held up by political pundits and economists across the galaxy as the prime example of what happens when a corporation is left unchecked by government regulation. And greed and ambition outranks everything else a company stands for. The Trade Federation is widely held responsible for its role in destabilizing the outer rim through price fixing and intimidation tactics. It would eventually play a huge role in starting the Separatist Crisis, which of course led to the Clone Wars. By the time of the Galactic Civil War, many decades later, many individuals in the galaxy still held an extremely negative view towards droids because of all the destruction carried out by the Trade Federation's mass-produced B-1 battle droids. And with the grotesque Numoidians at the helm of this organization, they were the perfect scapegoat for all of the suffering the galaxy endured, and their swift fall and collapse would go down in history as a warning to other corporations who decided to pursue profits in such an extreme way. But how did we get to this point? How did the Trade Federation amass so much power so quickly with such bad intentions? Well, most corporations start out small, manageable, and almost as blank slates. I mean, Facebook was supposed to connect everyone in the world with one another, not encourage genocides in Burma and lynch mobs in India. Amazon was supposed to just bring books to everyone at cheap and affordable prices, not destroy every small retail store across America, and weaponize our consumption patterns and data into more potential sales. The Trade Federation also started out with very pure and good intentions in 350 BBY. It was an officially republic-chartered organization, and its main job was to mediate between merchants and shipping firms who were trying to reach shipping agreements. Something that, honestly, the republic should have regulated themselves, but you'll see a trend of laissez-faire, or lazy-as economic policies by the republic, which will run parallel to the Trade Federation's own story. At the time, a group of transportation mega conglomerates like Pulsar Supertanker, Quasar Cargo, and Red Star Shipping Lines were operating an oligopoly that shut out smaller shipping companies from being able to compete in the rim. They did this by refusing to share navigational data and by hoarding hyperspace lane information all for themselves. At the same time, they priced out competitors at most of the major spaceports, making docking fees inaccessible to smaller operators. These companies could afford to do these things because of the massive scale of shipping they handled and the tiny profit margins and high risk that naturally accompanied the industry. Not only did this limit choices for consumers, these large shipping companies usually passed on the cost of maintaining their oligopoly to the consumers as well. Overall, it was an extremely negative system that encouraged smuggling and black market practices. But then came the Trade Federation, which was ruled by a directorate of seven individuals from vastly different backgrounds and different species. These individuals were supposed to break the stranglehold that the shipping conglomerates had over all traffic between the Rim and the Core World. The Trade Federation did this by organizing vendors into large groups so that they had much more negotiation power against the shipping companies. But eventually, the Trade Federation realized that they had enough businesses and vendors working with them to actually build a client base of their own. And so they gathered funding from investors and went to Horsch and Kessel Drive, one of the largest shipbuilders in the galaxy, and commissioned a fleet of LH3210 cargo freighters, otherwise known as the Lucre Hulk freighter. More than three kilometers in diameter, these ships had massive amounts of interior storage space, much more than anything else available in the galaxy at the time. This placed the Trade Federation in a very unique position. For one, now they were vertically integrated into the shipping industry. They were no longer just gathering vendors and negotiating contracts on their behalf. They were also providing them alternative options for shipping. Now, the legacy shipping companies still managed the routes going in between the core and rim regions. There was no change in the old arrangements. But the Trade Federation and their massive ships were perfectly suited for shipments of raw resources from the outer rim to the foundries and manufacturing worlds closer to the core. Now, this was during the High Republic period, where Chancellor Lena So was constructing her great works, and the Jedi Order was bringing the Starlight Beacon space station online in the Outer Rim. The Republic was supposed to finally fulfill its promise of bringing stable communications, hyperspace lane security, and economic prosperity to this region of the galaxy, something that the sparsely populated Outer Rim did not have the resources and capability to do itself. What they needed was Republic investment, and more importantly, security, because as long as bandits and pirate gangs like the Nile were roaming around ransacking everything, no one wanted to invest their hard-earned money into these areas. And without corporate investors, there would be no jobs, and if there were no jobs, no people would come and live there. This is basically the same problem that has plagued this region of space since the beginning of time. 
But where everyone else saw danger, the Trade Federation saw opportunity and new markets for exploitation. The Republic at this point was basically begging companies like the Trade Federation to set up operations out there and develop infrastructure like warehouses, shipyards, and retail outlets. During this period of time, many individuals within the Republic saw the Trade Federation as a positive force for good. It checked out all the boxes. It was a company that represented the Republic well through its diversity of uh, board members. It also invested quite a lot of money into dangerous areas and truly did improve the quality of life in those areas and brought commerce to otherwise underserved portions of the galaxy. In some ways, the government was almost relying on organizations like the Trade Federation. It was also around this time that the Trade Federation established its own trade defense force, which became a well-respected paramilitary force that was admired across the Republic for its professionalism. Even the judicial forces were impressed by how they operated. And soon smaller companies and even planets started aligning themselves with the Trade Federation. Some would become allies and others would just be bought out and become subsidiaries. It was around this time the Trade Federation really started dominating galactic trade and became more or less a cartel. It would use its economic and political power to suppress any opposition and further their control over the shipping lanes. But the Trade Federation was just a shipping company. And what they really needed in the Outer Rim was more mining operations, more refineries, more industrial factories that could produce goods for the Trade Federation to actually ship. By 124 BBY, the Galactic Senate, in an effort to attract more companies to the region, declared the Outer Rim as a completely free trade zone. Now that they didn't have to pay taxes in the Outer Rim, the Trade Federation's profits soared, which allowed them to further extend their control over Outer Rim to core trade routes. The Trade Federation would start price fixing. They would also adopt predatory behavior against their competitors, and they would start threatening any world or company that didn't listen to it by withholding essential deliveries of goods and supplies. Other companies like the Techno Union would join the Trade Federation and together these large conglomerates would start turning the Outer Rim into their own private kingdoms. These conglomerates would also watch each other's backs in the Senate and soon the Trade Federation not only became the very companies they were created to stop, they became even worse and more powerful. And with this shift in balance of power, the culture at the Trade Federation began changing as well. Instead of nurturing the free market and free trade, the Trade Federation was now obsessed with power, control, and constant expansion. Because after all, their experiences in the Outer Rim taught them that they would never be held responsible for their actions. While the Republic was completely helpless and inundated at the highest level with Trade Federation lobbyists and loyalists, small groups in the Outer Rim started taking matters into their own hand and attacking Trade Federation outposts and ships. The Stark Hyperspace War of 44 BBY was started when a group of pirates began hijacking Trade Federation back to shipments. This led to a huge shortage of this miraculous medicinal fluid and also further militarized the Trade Federation. This put a lot of bad attention on the Trade Federation as well and politicians and citizens within the Corps were finally realizing what a monster this organization had become. By 33 BBY, Supreme Chancellor Valorum advocated the restoration of taxation in the free trade zone. This was met with huge protests from the Trade Federation and their allies. This would effectively uproot their entire business model. At the same time, an internal ship was starting to happen in the Trade Federation. It started almost a decade before during the Stark Hyperspace War. The Nemoidian inner circle within the Trade Federation had grown increasingly powerful. And then mysteriously in 33 BBY, six of the non-Nemoidian members of the Directorate were assassinated and only New Gunray, the Nemoidian Viceroy, was left in charge. New Gunray would completely change the organization for the worse. He would authorize the legal blockade of Naboo, partly in response to the repeal of the free trade zone. And the rest is history. How did the Trade Federation fall so far? How did it become so bold that it would just openly attack a member state of the Republic without worrying at all about the consequences? Well, it's because for centuries the Republic had shown the Trade Federation favoritism. It held up the organization as a shining example of private enterprise and government cooperation. And because of all of this help, the Trade Federation eventually became so powerful that the Republic could no longer get rid of it. As a matter of fact, it would highly depend on it. And without checks and balances and an addiction to expansion, the Trade Federation eventually engineered their own fall by putting individuals who were kind of crazy, like New Gunray, in positions of power. The Trade Federation is a cautionary tale about what happens when the government gets way too close and almost starts depending on a corporation. You really need to approach regulation in a very balanced measure in order to ensure proper growth, but also long-term sustainable growth, which obviously the Trade Federation was not designed to create. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. 
As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.